This morning, we continue our series called What If? in the book of Galatians. We'll look in a few minutes at Galatians chapter 2. But I want to ask a question this morning. For those of you that are fellow gardeners, how's the garden growing? It's been amazing, hasn't it, with all the rain? Little effort has gone into, or at least I haven't put a lot of effort into watering my garden until the last week and a half because the rain has done a great job. And I went out the other day to look, and I thought, I don't know that I planted that. Whatever it is, I actually don't know what it is, some kind of melon. And I thought, I didn't, uh, I didn't plant that. And then there are a few extra plants in there that I thought, I don't remember planting anything like that over there. So we'll see what actually produces. But it's been a relatively easy gardening, watering season so far. But diversity in your garden is all important, isn't it? It's a good practice. It's common from year to year to move your garden plants around, to introduce new plants, to partner plants together. Now, if you're not a partner planter, you're going to learn something this morning. Some plants like other plants, and others don't. Peas like to grow next to beans and carrots and corn and cucumbers, but they don't like onions or garlic. Lettuce likes to grow near strawberries and beets and carrots, but they don't like beans and parsley. So there you go. If you didn't know that, you have learned something this morning. And all of that's to say that it makes a big difference when it comes to what is produced in your garden. Diversifying crop systems is a growing practice among farmers around the world. The University of Nevada, Reno, has worked to understand the need for greater crop diversity. Diversifying allows farmers to overcome production challenges, to increase input costs, to to, like increased input costs, varying weather factors, increased demands, new product, and revenue fluctuation. Growing up on the farm just north of Reno, Nevada, it was common practice for us to rotate three or four crops through the fields every couple of years. The standard crops of alfalfa and beans and peas, wheat and barley were everywhere. But now as you drive south from Twin Falls, you'll see carrots and lentils, canola, and other varieties of things that were never grown there when I was around. The change in irrigation practices and the ever-changing need to diversify has driven, driven farmers to try new crops. Crop diversification benefits far outweigh the risks of keeping two to three crops in rotation. So much so that the University of Nevada, Reno says that you should try to diversify up to 10 to 12 crops in an area. That's quite a lot. And then try to introduce some livestock to help. Pest management control reduces weeds and soil erosion, creates natural fertilizer and reduces the need for pesticides. Well, some of us could spend the rest of the day talking about crop diversification and our gardening. That's not why we're here this morning. But diversification is just as important in the church as it is on the farm. So as we journey through what we are calling the What If series, we come to the second chapter of Galatians to understand what Paul and his early church is working through. Galatians is likely Paul's first letter, written early on in his ministry. But Paul is direct. He's direct to the church, and he addresses an issue that's important for them and important for us. And he wants to make sure, as we looked at in chapter 1, that sharing the grace of Jesus and the freedom found in Jesus is important and what is taught. 
So let me read this morning from chapter 2, the first 10 verses of chapter 2. Fourteen years later, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response of a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. But I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run a race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might remain with us or remain with you. As for those that seem to be important, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God, God does not judge by external appearance. Those men added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching, to the, preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the Jews. For God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter, also an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Then they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. All they asked was that, they should, that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing we were eager to do. In Galatians 1.18, we read about Paul's first visit to Jerusalem. This was after three years in Arabia and then Damascus. On his first visit to Jerusalem, he saw Peter and James, the brother of, James, the brother of Jesus. Now Paul fills the church in on his second, revi- second visit, 14 years later. 14 years later. 14 years of learning and growing and teaching, preaching the gospel, Paul returns to Jerusalem, the center of faith. It's important to note that Paul was not summoned by those leaders, not like he was called down to the principal's office in trouble for some reason. He didn't go on his own direction, but by revelation, according to verse 2. 14 years is a long time. Can you remember what you were doing 14 years ago? Probably something different. It's a long time to do one thing and then go and present your case to the Christian leaders of the day. 14 years, Paul had been preaching to the Gentiles. Those previously outside of the faith now allowed in accepted as part of the family without taking on any Jewish practices. Paul's fear was that maybe the gospel of grace that he had been preaching was not complete and that the leaders of the day wouldn't recognize the work that he was doing. There were some that wanted to keep the old way of doing things in place to keep the Jewish practices of eating kosher meals and requiring circumcision for everyone to be included to be a Christian. But this was not Paul's message. But some were teaching this way, and Paul wanted to hear from the leaders himself on this matter. So he met privately with them, told them his side of the story, shared his understanding of the gospel to the Gentiles, while recognizing the gospel that Peter was preaching to the Jews. These were not two different gospels, but the same. Their content varied depending on the context, but they were not different gospels. By the end of their meeting, Paul and Peter were in agreement with one another in the ministries that they led. Paul would continue to share the good news to the Gentiles and Peter to the Jews. They had nothing to add to Paul's message. 
nothing to instruct him further or to change his practice, but to remember the poor as he was eager to do. So what do we learn from all of this as Paul heads back and writes this letter to the church in Galatia? First, that there's great unity and diversity. Paul and Peter differed in so many different ways. But their agreement, their common ground was on the person and work of Jesus. That's where they agreed. They agreed to go and do their called ministry in two very different groups. They were willing to include each other in their ministry in the big picture of what God was up to. And they were able to find common ground, helping those in need, remembering the poor, which was an integral part of the good news and still is today. Second, even though that they were, had very different ministries and people groups, God was at work sharing the good news both to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Paul and his ministry to the Gentiles was a growing church, and so was Peter in his ministry to the Jews They each were growing what would become an amazing, diversified something called the church. Jews and Gentiles, Greeks and Romans, slaves and free, rich and poor, men and women, young and old. And we, we are the beneficiaries of their work. As God worked through them and those, and those after them to bring people together, diversity in unity. We live that out each day in a country that prides itself on inclusion and diversity. What should the church of today look like? It should be as diverse as the culture around us. It should be as welcoming and diverse, focused on the good news of Jesus and allowing this unity even though we have differences. The challenge is not much different than Paul's day. We live in a polarizing world. But just like changing in farm practices, we need to recognize the benefits of diversity. We need to be able to see what God is doing in all peoples and cultures and groups and be willing to welcome them with open arms. I talked earlier about our family farm. That farm was about 10 miles south of town. Back then, and maybe st still today, the south side of Twin Falls was considered the low-income side of town. It traditionally had a large population of Hispanic people, and the school which I attended for elementary school was largely Hispanic, and most of my friends were as well. The school didn't even have grass for a playground. It had asphalt. Maybe that just made us a little bit tougher than all the other elementary schools in town. But only until recently did the soccer field become grass and not asphalt. And the baseball field become grass instead of asphalt. But the school board, as school boards do, they shifted the boundaries halfway through my elementary years sending my siblings and I off to another higher-end school. And they had grass on their playground. And what, what I realized through that school year and a couple years was that I had the challenge of trying to figure out how do I make new friends and keep my old Hispanic friends as well. And that was a challenge, one that I still reflect on today because they weren't as welcomed in that school as they were in our other school. They weren't as welcome because of their ethnic background and the color of their skin. As much as I would like to say that that is not the world we live in today, it still is. It happens here in Canada, 
It happens around the world. It happens in churches, and it happens beyond the doors of the church. We struggle to find unity in our diversity just about everywhere, including the church. Martin Luther King Jr. called Sunday mornings the most segregated hour in America. And this is largely still the case today. We have all kinds of churches, don't we? Churches that separate us instead of make us work together to figure out our differences. We separate over theological differences so we don't have to talk about them. We separate over economic status, ethnicity, music, preaching style, and just about everything else. It's easier. It's easier that way, isn't it? We worship with the people that we like because they are like us. They are the same. They think the same. They dress like us. They work like us. They have the same ideas and ideals as us. There's little debating or disagreeing because they're just like us. And that makes life so much easier. But that's not the church. At least this is only a fabricated false church. And Paul is calling us to be diversified in our understanding and welcoming of all people. In his book called A Fellowship of Difference, author and speaker Scott McKnight describes a church as a salad. And I apologize if you were short on breakfast this morning, but I'm going to talk about salad for a minute. He says that there are three ways to eat salad. There's the American way. He's American, by the way. There's the weird way, and there's the right way. The American way, he says, is to fill the salad bowl with iceberg lettuce, some spinach, and even some tomatoes sliced, maybe some carrots and olives, and then you smother it with dressing. Ranch, Thousand Island, Italian, doesn't matter, but you smother it so much that the only thing you taste is the dressing. The weird way is to separate each item around the plate. You eat it all individually without any dressing, making sure that they don't touch each other. The right way, according to Scott McKnight, is to gather all the ingredients. Some spinach, kale, chard, arugula, iceberg lettuce, chop it all into fine bits. Cut up some tomatoes, carrots, onions, red peppers, dried berries, nuts, sprinkle on some cheese, and then you drizzle it with some very fine olive oil, which somehow brings the taste to life and fullness. And he says, surely this is what God intended when he created mixed salad. The early church was becoming a mixed salad from all walks of life, all over the social map, and they were able to form a fellowship of different tastes, a mixed salad of the best kind. This has not changed for us today. Though we've come accustomed to being a weird salad or even an American salad, God calls us to be the right salad. And most of us have probably grown up in a church of likes and sames and similarities. And this is a big ask. And yet Paul is clear in his call, and so is Peter, to form this mixed salad of people. Ignite continues that the church is God's grand experiment in which different get connected. Unlikes form a fellowship. The formerly segregated are integrated. They are to be one, not scattered all over the city. They are one in Christ Jesus. And in the salad bowl, that holds the differences together. 
how willing are we to be diverse, have diverse in our church family, to welcome those that may think a little bit differently than us, to welcome those that live a little bit different than us, that look a little bit different than us, willing to welcome them with open arms alongside the poor and the needy, the orphans, the widows, those that have been outcast from our society, those that don't fit. Jesus calls us to welcome them with grace and with freedom and to build a relationship together through the foundation of Jesus Christ. That is our call as a church. That is every church's call from Paul's time to ours today, to find our unity even amongst our diversity. Let's pray together. Father God, we ask that your spirit would move in our lives to see Jesus regardless of our outward appearances, in spite of our political and economic interests. May we be your church Surrender to the gospel of grace and freedom and diversity, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.